Okay, we will get started because we have a lot of information to share tonight. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Taylor Mead and I'm the Director of Health Programs for Special Olympics New York. Really excited to have everyone join us tonight. Um, you know, I know that this topic was uh, was something that has been popular with a lot of our partners and a lot of our families over the past couple of months as we've continued to host these forum offerings. Um, and just a little bit of background, the virtual health and wellness forums are an offering that is open not only to those involved with the Special Olympics community, but those that have intellectual disabilities or support people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, so we look to bring really important topics regarding health and wellness to light and uh, be a resource for people to be able to learn about those topics. Um, just two quick housekeeping items. Uh, we ask that um, until the end of the presentation, when we do have a question and answer section, uh, that you wait and hold your questions. You'll be able to submit them in the chat or come off mute and ask your question. Um, and then we will also provide a link to a uh, form. If you are not comfortable asking your question on the live offering, then we'll be able to, to take on that question or any feedback that you have after the presentation is over and get back to you there. So without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker tonight. So we are very lucky to have Laura Robinson join us. And Laura has over 30 years of experience in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, which is a background that includes direct care, staff training, program development, regulatory oversight, and compliance, qualitative and quantitative research, and program evaluation. She has been a NTG regional affiliated trainer since 2014 and participates on the geriatric assessment clinic team at the Finger Lakes Developmental Disability Service Office in Rochester, New York. Laura joined the University of Rochester Medical Center in 2004 and is currently the program coordinator for the Finger Lakes Geriatric Education Center a HRSA-funded GWEP in the Division of Geriatrics and Aging in Department of Medicine. She is also a part-time doctoral student in human development at the Warner School. Her doctoral studies will investigate redefining intelligence for older adults with IDD. So, Laura, I'm going to pass it off to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Taylor. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight, especially during dinner time. I appreciate that. So just to um, let you know who I am before we begin, I'm a Caucasian white female in her 50s with blue eyes, brown hair. I'm wearing a white Special Olympic sweatshirt. So yay, be brave. My background is my dining room wall as my dining room has been my home office since COVID. So I'm super happy to be here with you tonight to talk about dementia. One disclaimer, I am not a doctor, I am not a nurse, but I work with a lot of them in geriatrics and sometimes I can use medical terms that might be complicated. I'm gonna try really hard not to do this. So please let me know when I use words that make no sense to you and I will find a different way to say them. And I do plan to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. So with that, we will begin. We're gonna talk about what dementia is and what do we do about it? So I have no disclosures. I want you to know that no one no pharmaceutical companies, no medical um, equipment companies have paid me for my opinion. My opinion is my own. And here are what we're gonna, here's what we're going to talk about tonight, the learning objectives. So we're going to define dementia. We're going to describe signs and symptoms of the different types of dementia. Then we're going to list ways to prevent dementia because as of yet, there is no cure. So we really want to work on preventing dementia. And then how do we support people when they do have dementia? What do we do? So let's start right off the bat with what is dementia? So we all know that everybody is living longer. We're getting older. One of the conditions that happens more often as we get older is called dementia. And if you remember nothing else that I tell you tonight, please remember that dementia is not part of typical aging. Not everybody is going to get dementia. Dementia happens from a variety of reasons, but it is not part of your typical aging. So dementia is a term kind of like an umbrella. 
And there's lots of different types of dementia under that umbrella. So you'll see in the picture, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. There's also something called vascular dementia that happens when we have a stroke or a blood clot. There's Lewy body dementia. There's, so there's these little bodies called Lewy bodies that we can find through a blood or a test of your cerebrospinal fluid and then frontotemporal dementia. And there's several other kinds too, but these are the main ones. So dementia really is just a collection of symptoms that impact the brain and they, in, and it, they interfere with everyday life. Alzheimer's disease, like I said, is the most common. So we're gonna spend the most time talking about that one and some changes in our thinking and behavior are reversible and not truly dementia. So we're gonna talk about something called a differential diagnosis. So what to look for and what to ask for when you go to the doctor, because not every change that we go through as we get older is really dementia. And again, because it's super important, dementia is not part of normal aging or typical aging, okay? So what does dementia impact? So there's three main areas that dementia impacts and our brain has a lot of jobs. So think about the brain handling how we think, how we move, how we process information, the information we get from our senses. So how we taste, how we smell, how we touch. And our brain tells us what to do with that information. It also tells us how to behave at home or at work and when not to cause trouble and things like that. So our brain is the core of who we are. And dementia impacts different parts of the brain, depending on what kind we have. And then dementia slowly changes how we think, how we function, and how we behave. So some of the areas affected by dementia are on the slide. So one of the big ones that we often think about is memory, especially short-term memory, like not remembering what I had for lunch, not remembering where I put my keys, or not remembering people's names. There's also language skills. Sometimes we forget words, like in the middle of a sentence, I don't remember what I was going to say, or we see something that we use all the time, like a water bottle, but, but I can't remember what the water bottle is. So language skills can be imp impacted. There's also focusing and the ability to pay attention. Maybe nothing keeps our interest anymore. There's reasoning and judgment. So when there's dementia, sometimes people make bad choices, like going outside without a coat or putting themselves in dangerous situations. Sensory perception also can change. So our senses are our hearing, our sight, our touch, our taste, our smell. Smell is one of the areas that um, is coming up in the research literature as being impacted when people have dementia. And then last is sequencing tasks. So knowing how to maybe make a sandwich. So taking bread out, taking peanut butter and jelly because that's a delicious sandwich, taking those out and knowing how to sequence your tasks and make a sandwich by the end. So dementia can impact us in many different ways. But the three big ones that I usually group these things into are cognition, so how we think, and then behavior, how we act, and then function, the things that we do. And then all, again, all these areas are gonna be impacted differently based on the type of dementia we have and which symptoms are noticed first. So remember that umbrella slide, that picture, there were four kinds of dementia on that slide. And on this slide, even though the, the print is a little bit tiny, I wanna tell you what the key symptoms are for each of those types of dementia. So with Alzheimer's disease, see the red circle? I think I can have a... No, I don't have a thingy to point. Do I have a pointer? Laser pointer, here we go. Okay, so see this red circle that goes around the, the uh, symptom? So under Alzheimer's disease, it mostly impacts, and these are the things that you're gonna see first. So memory, our visual spatial ability. So a lot of times we see people that um, don't have good depth perception or lose their depth, depth perception. And you'll see them hesitate maybe at a transition in a room where the flooring is different in one room going to another, usually bathrooms. I don't know why they do this, but there's like a marble slab on the floor <laughs> to your bathroom. So that's a difficult transition for some people or getting on and off of a bus or a van. And then the, the, the other most recent, the other most um, typical disturbance is language disturbances. So maybe people that were super chatty or super talkative 
now don't really engage socially or don't have the words or can't find the words or just don't want to socialize anymore. So those are going to be the biggest changes that you see in people with Alzheimer's disease. With frontotemporal dementia, there is a big personality change when there's frontotemporal dementia. So maybe you'll see someone who was used to be calm and polite and friendly now getting angry and getting a little bit um, aggressive. So personality changes. Next is Lewy body dementia. So the circle is showing us that visual hallucinations are pretty common with Lewy body dementia. So when people are telling you that they see things, pay attention to that because that could be a sign of Lewy body dementia. But again, not everything is going to be dementia. So you always want to get a differential diagnosis. And then the last one, vascular dementia, has a very abrupt onset. This is usually a blood clot um, that either parks somewhere in your brain or a blood vessel ruptures somewhere in the brain. And there's a drastic, like immediate change in someone's personality or their behavior or their function. So there's going to be a very significant difference in that person from one minute to the next minute or from one day to the next day, depending on when it's noticed. So these are just some of the symptoms of the four main kinds of dementias. So why is it important to know which type of dementia we have? Aren't they all the same? Don't they all result in the same thing? Well, it's important to know what kind because the different types of dementia have different characteristics. So it's really helpful to know that particular behaviors or changes are part of a disease and not bad behavior or challenging behavior. And then the type of dementia also impacts which medications can be used. And then we also wanna know what kind of dementia it is so that we can rule out treatable causes, things that might not be dementia, but are a problem for someone we could treat that and maybe give them that skill or that ability back. One of the things we see frequently in geriatric assessment clinic are people that maybe just need hearing aids. Maybe their hearing has gone down. So that's why they're not socializing. That's why they're not answering questions. That's not why they're not talking. Or people that might have, had, might have sleep apnea or don't know they have sleep apnea and getting a sleep study might be helpful. So we always want to make sure, again, we figure out what's going on with a person and we rule out things that we can take care of. So prevalence by dementia type. So which one happens the most? We already saw on that slide that Alzheimer's is the most common, but there's not been a lot of studies done on people with developmental disabilities. So I put this slide in just to talk about people with developmental disabilities. And this study was done back in 2007. So it's a little bit older and I'm not gonna bore you with all the, de all the details and stuff because I'm kind of a nerd about this and I enjoy it, but you guys would probably get bored. But what I will tell you <laughs> is especially since there's not a lot of studies done on people with developmental disabilities, Alzheimer's is still the most common in this population. So almost 9% out of this study that they did of 222 people followed by vascular dementia at almost 3%, Lewy body at almost 6%, and then frontotemporal around 3%. So again, just notice from this slide that even with people with IDD, the most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So this slide is a list of what people sometimes think are symptoms of dementia. So typical things happen when we get older, and those things are in the column on the left where it says typical aging. That's the left column. And then things that are problematic and might indicate dementia, that's on the right side of the screen. So let's go through these. So the first one is typical aging. Complains about memory loss. Who does this? We all do this. You know, I'm having a senior moment, even though that's kind of ageist, people say it. Um, but I'm able to provide detailed examples of forgetfulness. Like, oh, you remember last week when I couldn't find my car keys or you remember the other day I couldn't remember so-and-so's name. When you can give examples about your memory loss, that's not dementia. But when you have symptoms of dementia, you may complain of memory loss only if somebody asks you and then you're not able to give them any specific examples of that memory loss. The next section down where it says occasionally searches for words. That's part of typical aging. No problem. 
The next part where it might be dementia is if you're doing frequent word finding pauses or substitutions. You know, I just can't think of so-and-so's name. Or maybe you call that person a different name just to fill in a word. That could be dementia. So going back over to typical aging, sometimes we may have to pause to remember directions, but we don't get lost in familiar places. Whereas someone with dementia might get lost in familiar places and take a long time to return home. Going back to typical aging, so we remember recent important events and our conversations are not impaired. They're not difficult at all. But a symptom of dementia might be a noticeable decline or loss of memory, especially for recent events and the, the ability to have a conversation about them. Maybe someone doesn't even remember that they had lunch, let alone what they had for lunch. And then last, we have interpersonal social skills are at the same level they've always been. So if you have somebody that's super chatty or enjoys to talk and enjoys going out to the movies or bowling, they still enjoy going out to the movies and bowling and talking. However, when it might be dementia, you might have a loss of interest in social activities or somebody might start behaving in an inappropriate or a challenging way. So those are some of the ways that we can kind of tease out whether something is dementia or a part of typical aging. So let's talk about the most common form of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, because I think this is where we'll get a lot of questions. So this slide comes from the 2024 Dementia Facts and Figures put out by the Alzheimer's Association, and Taylor is going to put a link to that in the chat. I believe she's also going to send it out to you later. It's a huge document. But, but since Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, I like to go right to the best source of information, which is the Alzheimer's Association. They do a fantastic job every year putting out a brand new facts and figures, and it's chock full of information. So I do want to point out two things. So biological changes in our brain can happen up to 20 years before we show any change in our behavior, in our function, or our personality. Okay, and they have also included in this timeline something called mild cognitive impairment, and it is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Not everybody with mild cognitive impairment or MCI, as they call it, will get dementia, but it is a risk factor. So when it is dementia, then the symptoms begin to really impact our functioning, our behavior, and our cognition more and more. So here we talk about preclinical Alzheimer's disease. That's 20 years, you know, back when it when we started first getting the plaques and tangles and some of the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. Then next we might move to mild cognitive impairment where there might be some very mild symptoms. You know, my partner, he says, sometimes I don't hear him. I think that I'm just selectively not hearing him. Maybe I have mild cognitive impairment. We don't know. So there's things that make you go, hmm. So next is dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, but it's very mild. So some of your symptoms are now starting to interfere with everyday activities, but you're still pretty independent. Next, we move to dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, but moderate. These are symptoms that really do interfere with everyday activities. So maybe if someone is driving and they're getting lost almost every time they go out, Maybe it's time to stop driving. Maybe it's time to let somebody else help with cooking if someone's leaving the stove on a lot. So this is when symptoms become problematic. And then severe Alzheimer's is when symptoms do interfere with almost every, every everyday activity. So people that need help with eating or dressing or bathing and, house, and housework. So it, it really becomes debilitating at that point in time. So what causes Alzheimer's disease? So unfortunately, the exact causes are still unknown and vary from person to person. There are some genetic causes, there are some lifestyle causes, there are some environmental causes. But what we know now is that this damage begins 10 to 20 years before we actually show any signs or symptoms of it. And age is also a significant factor. So the older people get, the more likely they are to have some form of dementia or Alzheimer's disease. 
So what is Alzheimer's disease? Just a little bit on the science of it. So in these little pictures, I want you to see that the bottom picture, this is what healthy cells look like. These are your neurons in your brain, and they are reaching out and touching each other because that's how they communicate. The messages go zipping back and forth in between these cells. But when you look at the bigger picture, which is what Alzheimer's is, you'll notice all these big gobbledygook clots of plaques and tangles. So the cells aren't able to reach out. There's things in the way. Their little arms aren't working anymore. So they can't get the messages through. So our brains don't work as well. They Parts of our brain can't communicate with each other. And then they eventually can't communicate with the rest of our body. So that's what Alzheimer's does is these big globs of amyloid beta protein and some of the tau tangles get in the way of the neurons in our brain. And they actually kill these cells so that over time, our brain becomes about 30% smaller by the time of death. And some medication can help in the early stages of Alzheimer's, but generally there's nothing that's going to cure it. And there's nothing really that's going to stop these, these plaques and tangles from, from accumulating yet. We're still looking for a cure. So in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, so here are some of the things that you might see. Memory problems are reported. Um, common problems are managing finances. Who has fun with money? Like money is hard. It is hard to manage finances, <laughs> even without Alzheimer's disease. But if there's difficulty where there's never been difficulty before, that's probably something to get checked out. Household chores become difficult, shopping, cooking. So some of your instrumental activities of daily living really become difficult in the early stages. A lot of people kind of chalk these changes up to typical aging. So it might be, but again, it also might be good to get these things checked out. And then short-term memory is mostly affected. And then your long-term memory, so things that you did as a child or in high school or back in the day, those things remain intact. So Alzheimer's symptoms in the middle stages, this is where you're going to start to see some personality change. You're going to start to see some behavior change. Some people become very impulsive. This is where you'll see a person who was usually really nice, maybe jokes around, maybe becoming a little agitated. The filter is gone. You might see some new sexual behaviors. You might see some anger. You might see some hoarding. You might see people that just don't care anymore, just not interested in things at all. And then poor judgment, insight, and problem solving also come up then too. And in the later stages, so you're going to have the loss of ability to perform activities of daily living. So you're bathing, you're grooming, you're dressing, and even feeding. People just aren't interested in eating or may not know how to feed themselves. And their moods might get agitated or restless. And this is where you'll see a lot of wandering as well. It's, uh, it's believed that people kind of get lost in space and time and don't really have an anchor holding them down. So might just be looking for something always, just not knowing what they're looking for, but that need to walk. And if you can, definitely encourage that and walk with people. So how do we diagnose dementia? We know what it is now and who might be at risk, but how do we know who has it? So usually we go to a physician, usually a neurologist or a geriatrician, and sometimes your primary care physician might be able to diagnose dementia. You will not be able to diagnose, unless you're a physician on this call, um, but you can help provide history, describing symptoms, the changes the person is going through, and any information that's going to help the diagnostic process, especially about who the person was before the changes happen. There are a lot of traditional screening tools that are used to diagnose dementia with the general population, but they're not always helpful with people with developmental disabilities. So there's things you're going to hear about like the MMSE, the mini mental status exam, or the slums or the MOCA. Those are great for the general population, but they don't work so well with people with developmental disabilities. Instead, we've got a couple different questionnaires that um, were created by researchers, such as the dementia questionnaire for people with MR. And I know we don't say MR anymore, but this was created back in the 90s and in Europe. Um, and then the dementia scale for Down syndrome. There's also the NTG's EDSD, and then Taylor's going to put a link to that in the chat as well, and that'll be in your, your packet that you receive in your email. 
but this is a wonderful tool that was created specifically for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to kind of benchmark or baseline where are your abilities at today so that in three, six months, a year later, we can fill it out again and compare, are you still doing okay in all these different areas or have there been some changes? So I do wanna say that um, there was one of my mentors, Dr. Mike Henderson, who uh, pioneered the concept of geriatric assessment in older adults with IDD. And he had a clinic at Monroe Community Hospital in Rochester. And I had the privilege back then of being a student and sitting in on his clinic with him. But over the time that he ran the clinic, he saw 88 individuals with developmental disabilities um, who came into his clinic with a diagnosis of dementia. And by the time he was done with his geriatric assessment of them and using tools, not for the general population, but his knowledge of people with developmental disabilities and being a geriatrician, at the end, only seven left with a diagnosis of dementia based on his use of a good differential diagnosis. So the tool that you use is extremely important. So I keep talking about differential diagnosis. What is this? So differential diagnosis is the process of distinguishing a disease or a condition from other presenting similar signs and symptoms that somebody might have. So first we're trying to establish if a disease is really present and then determine the cause and kind of tease apart what are the different things going on here for this person. And the whole goal of it is to rule out treatable conditions hopefully have the person receive appropriate treatment and support services if they're available, and then to maintain the highest possible quality of life and functioning for people. As we get older, we all become more of the person of who we are as we age. And any change in behavior or personality really should be taken as a clue that there is a problem that may need intervention. And personalities are the way that each of us interacts with others in the world around us. So I'm usually a pretty happy-go-lucky person. So if you see that I become a cranky old woman, <laughs> something is very wrong. It may be a short-term thing, it may be a long-term thing, but something is very wrong because I like to laugh and enjoy life. So use your knowledge of the people that you work with or live with or care for and use that knowledge to help guide healthcare practitioners on decisions of screenings and assessments and interventions. And it's an ongoing process as healthcare advocacy, even if there is a diagnosis of dementia, healthcare advocacy does not end with a diagnosis of dementia. We still have to continue to advocate for people to maintain a high quality of life for them and make sure all their needs are met. So the essentials of a good differential diagnosis or diagnostic workup, here are some of the things I'm not going to read this whole slide to you, but I will leave it up while I take a sip of water. So these are some of the things that you want your physician to request on your behalf to make sure that they have the full picture of what's going on. And they want the full picture of what's going on because there are so many possible reasons for changes and decline in functioning in older adults with IDD besides dementia and related causes. So for older people in general, a diagnosis can be challenging because there's often more than one cause to the change in function or decline in functioning. So as older adults with IDD might have challenges in communication or cognitive ability prior to some recent symptoms or changes, um, each one really needs to be looked at and ruled out and appropriate treatment provided if possible. Because the complexity of diagnosis and the risk for Diagnostic overshadowing, which let me explain that to you as well, in adults with IDD is overwhelming because not a lot of physicians or healthcare providers are trained in people with developmental disabilities. You all know that once we find a good doctor or a good nurse practitioner or a good physician assistant with IDD, we're like, yes, we finally found somebody that understands. So not everybody out there is like that. So diagnostic overshadowing happens, and this can, can be from anyone. When a physician or a healthcare provider treating you is just like dismissing your symptoms and saying, oh, well, that's because of your developmental disability, or, well, that's because you're getting older. 
those aren't acceptable answers. So health advocacy continues. We can't, we can't accept those answers. We have to say, no, no, I'd like you to look into it and go back to that other slide. I'd like you to look into it with some of these things <laughs> and tell me and make sure. My favorite is, um, you know, I, I, had, I had hurt my shoulder and I went to my doctor and I said, hey, you know, I hurt my shoulder, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it might be age. You know, you're, you're getting up there. And I was like, wait, but, but this shoulder's okay. <laughs> this shoulder's the same age. So no, don't accept those kinds of answers. Okay. So advocate. Advocacy just needs to continue. All right. So these are some of the conditions on this slide that might be, that might look like dementia, but are not dementia. So if someone has a stroke, side effects of medications, polypharmacy. Who's heard that big word, polypharmacy? It just means people end up, as we get older, we take more and more medications. So once we take more and more medications, now we're getting medications for the side effects of the medications, and that leads to more medications. So we have to kind of tease apart which of these medications are really, really essential for us, because the side effects of medications can mess up our cognition, our behavior, and our functioning. Nutritional deficits and imbalances. How's our diet? And I don't mean we're on a diet. I mean, what are we eating? Are we eating good things like fruits and vegetables and getting our protein in and carbs and staying away from super processed foods? I will let you have that discussion on your own. Alcohol and drug abuse. We know these are not good for us, but they can cause cognitive difficulties. Hypothyroidism. So when your thyroid is not working right, we, we lose energy. We don't feel right. We can't think straight. Dehydration who's getting in their water every day. Same thing with nutrition. We need certain things to keep our body functioning well. If we have comorbidities or we have medical conditions that are going on, like cardiovascular disease, that can cause a lot of difficulties and that ca could cause some symptoms that mimic dementia. There are environmental challenges that we all face as well. There could be toxins or pollutants in the environment. It, for me, it's spring right now, and, and all the pollen in the air really just makes me sneezy and sleepy. That could, that could mimic dementia. Sensory impairments always mimic dementia. So I already talked about hearing impairments, but if there's visual impairments as well, people who are losing their vision from macular degeneration or glaucoma or a number of other conditions might be more secure just staying put and not interacting and not doing the things that they used to do. So check all the senses. Depression can also mimic dementia because again, that loss of interest in doing things and not wanting to be around people. Lyme disease is very complex and can impact multiple systems in our bodies at, at the time. Uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. So I know some people are born with this. Some people acquire it later in life, but the pressure on your brain can ca cause changes in your brain, which can cause changes in cognition and function and behavior. And then last but not least, and I've seen this several times, people that need a referral for a sleep study to determine whether or not they have sleep apnea. Because think about the days that you wake up and you have not slept good the night before. Are you the same? Is there a likelihood that you might be a little crankier? Yes, that's me. And that you might need a little more coffee? Yes, that's also me. And you might just want to go back to bed and not want to deal with people. And yes, also me sometimes. Not today. So... Let's talk for a minute about Down syndrome. There is an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease for people with Down syndrome. It is not 100%. So I asked you to remember one thing, if you remember nothing else from this training, is that Alzheimer's disease or dementia is not guaranteed as we get older. The second thing I want you to remember is that not all people with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's disease. Is there a greater risk? Absolutely. Now, I know a lot of you in this audience probably already know what Down syndrome is, and that's fantastic, but just a little bit of background is Down syndrome is caused by a genetic abnormality. It's an extra full or partial copy of chromosome 21. That's why it's called trisomy 21. So this extra copy of genetic material actually alters the course of development and causes the characteristics that we know as Down syndrome. And many people with Down syndrome age prematurely with signs of aging beginning in their 30s. So we might start seeing some wrinkles. We might start seeing some gray hair. And also uh, adults with Down syndrome are at risk for diseases in later life up to about 20 years earlier than the general population. And this includes dementia. 
So with people with Down syndrome, they have earlier onset of dementia or Alzheimer's disease than their general population. So usually they'll start showing signs in their 40s. Management is usually similar to the general population. However, the time frame for Alzheimer's disease is a much shorter course in people with Down syndrome. So they so usually Alzheimer's starts out with, with some plaques in the brain from the amyloid beta protein, getting kind of gunky and making those little uh, um, plaques <laughs> in the brain. But then also there's something called tau tangles, which in the general population usually occur a little bit later in the progression of the disease. However, with people with Down syndrome, you're gonna start getting those plaques and tangles at the same time which means your brain is going to have a lot harder time communicating and having those little neurons stretching out and touching each other and being able to send messages is going to get a lot harder. So the course of the disease for Alzheimer's uh, in, in people with Down syndrome is much shorter. So it might run about seven to 10 years from diagnosis or from when you start seeing those significant changes. There is no strong evidence that Alzheimer's drugs benefit. I do have a slide on medications coming up. Um, just remember depression and thyroid disease can mimic dementia and there's a higher prevalence of, or it's more common to have Hashimoto's, um, Hashimoto's disease in people with Down syndrome. So thyroid should really get checked out. Normal age associated deficits are common in people with Down syndrome. However, you might see some more uh, hearing loss and vision loss and behavior changes in this population. And then there's about 75% uh, of people with Down syndrome will develop seizures during the course of Alzheimer's disease if they do have it. So diagnostic overshadowing. So again, remembering that sometimes physicians don't pick up on things. There are specific risk factors for adults with Down syndrome that may appear as symptoms similar to Alzheimer's disease, resulting in an increased risk for a misdiagnosis and assumption of Alzheimer's dementia. So on this slide is just a list of the few specific risk factors that may appear, not risk factors, but few specific um, conditions that might appear to be Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's disease. So we've got seizures, we've got stroke, depression, side effects of medication, dehydration, vitamin B12 deficiency, and then again, hearing and visual impairment. So again, never settle for a, a diagnosis of dementia after just one medical visit, especially if it's a typical office visit of only 15 minutes. There may be some exceptional practitioners out there, which I'm hoping, but definitely opt for, no, nope, we'd like to see a specialist, or we'd like to see a neurologist, or we'd like to see a geriatrician, or we'd like to get a second opinion and have someone do a really thorough differential diagnosis. So what can we do? So what happens? Somebody gets a diagnosis of dementia, and what do we do? Well, let me back up for a minute and talk about risk factors, because um, these things are going to increase your chances of having dementia. And as of right now, there's no cure for dementia. So I'd rather focus on prevention. So what can we do? Some of the biggest risk, risk factors as of this paper that I found in 2000 or 2022 in the Journal of the American Medical Association's Neurology Journal says that the top three risk factors for dementia right now in a sample that they looked at were midlife obesity. So those of us getting a little fluffy around the middle, those of us gaining some pounds as we get older. So midlife obesity, physical inactivity, so not doing things. And I'm talking to an audience that, that is uh, Special Olympics and athletes here. So I know you guys are active, so stay active. Get more involved, do more things, but definitely don't be a couch potato. And then low educational attainment. So people that just you know aren't learning anymore. It doesn't mean go back to school but find something that you wanna learn. There's tons of videos to learn things online, but just keep your brain active and engaged, okay? So these are huge risk factors for dementia. So obesity or being heavy, overweight, being physically inactive, and then just not using your brain. So definitely use it or you're gonna lose it, okay? Prevention is key. So what are some warning signs? So these symptoms have to be notable and usually several of them have to occur together. 
But while you're working on prevention, it's also important to know what some of these warning signs are. So we're gonna start here at the top. So an unexpected memory loss. So you just can't remember, you're just losing information. Difficulty doing usual tasks, things that might've always been easy for you, like maybe vacuuming or taking a walk. These things become more difficult. Getting lost or misdirected, especially in the home. I know some of us live in large, older homes and it might not always be a straight path to find the bathroom or find your bedroom, but if you get lost within the home or in your neighborhood where you've lived for a long time, let somebody know because that could be a symptom. Confusion in familiar situations. So when you're confused, when you've been, you know, in your kitchen or you're in the living room and you're kind of looking around like, I don't know where I am, or you notice this in someone else or a day program or at work. Confusion in familiar situations is a big key. Personality changes. So again, somebody that's not quite their usual self needs to be noticed. Problems with gait or walking, there are a lot of studies now showing that ambulation, how we walk or how we move through a space could be a symptom, an early symptom of dementia. And then an onset of new seizures. So you know something is not right in your brain if you're having some seizures. So all of these things, by the, each of these things by themselves may not be dementia, but if you see several of them together, this is a cause for concern. So in our geriatric assessment clinic, we ask about all of these different areas. We have people come in, um, we have direct service professionals, we have nurses, we have mom and dad, family members, everyone comes in and gives us answers to these questions about when did the changes start? How often did they happen? When did they begin? And how has the person responded to these changes? How's their quality of life? What can we do to support them? How do we keep them engaged in things that they enjoy? And the key is that we have people there that can tell us about these different warning signs. So if you see something, notice something, write it down or tell somebody to write it down and keep track of them because this is the important information we need when we're doing a clinic or when someone is gonna assess you. So always document it and talk to your family or your team about what you see. And if we don't think it's dementia, we provide recommendations that could benefit the person. I think I've mentioned this a couple of times already. The, one of the most common things is sleep apnea and getting people to a sleep study because sleep really messes up how people act and think and function. So again, but if you notice these symptoms and they keep happening again and again and again, it's really time to see your physician so they can do some testing. So earlier I mentioned the NTG, which stands for National Task Groups, Early Detection Screen for Dementia, because typical tools that were for screening dementia in the general population, they're designed for people that have an average baseline intelligence, and they're not useful for detecting cognitive impairment in adults with Down syndrome or any other developmental disability. So this tool was created by a member of the NTG, and it is a screening tool. It is not an assessment tool, but we do recommend that you start using it annually for people with Down syndrome, start using it at age 40. And then if you don't have Down syndrome, probably around age 50. And it's four pages long. It doesn't take very long to fill out, but just gives you a good picture of where somebody is in terms of their skills and abilities and where some problem areas might be. And then also, what does a diagnosis mean? So getting a diagnosis of dementia may seem like, oh, that's depressing, it's awful, but it does give you a name for the problem that you've been experiencing or the person has been experiencing. Does it change the person? No. However, it does give caregivers and team members and people at work some comfort in knowing why and what's happening, why are these changes occurring, and maybe what can we look forward to in the future? It allows for important service planning to take place, and it provides access to helpful resources and organizations. And I do want to take a minute to talk about medications briefly and non-medical treatments. So as of right now, there is no cure for any type of dementia. There are a couple medications that were created to slow down 
Alzheimer's disease. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because most of the medications, I can't, I can't say them properly. So Aducan, Aducanumab was created. It has just recently been taken off the market as well by the manufacturer, not for a safety reason, but they want to just, uh, they're reprioritizing resources in Alzheimer's disease. And then Lecanumab, both of these played a role in stopping or preventing the protofibrils that lead, that lead or part, are part of the um, amyloid beta plaques in the brain. So there's those two that were meant to specifically slow down Alzheimer's disease. And then the other medications that we have are treatment for symptoms. So you can see some of the medications on the screen. Um, Denezapazil is uh, for thinking of it, ability. Rivastigmine is for also helping with thinking ability. Galantamine is for memory and awareness. Memantine helps the brain communicate and better, and it helps lessen confusion. And then the last two, I'm not even going to try and say, but one of them is for agitation and one of them is for people who don't sleep well. So it's just treating the different symptoms that people might have. But there are also things that we can do that are not medications. So these are non-drug treatments or also called non-pharmaceutical treatments. And these really don't change the underlying biology of the disease. They're often used with the goal of maintaining or improving cognitive function, quality of life, engagement, and the ability to perform activities of daily living. So non-drug treatments usually include things like physical activity. So there's that exercise again, um, memory and orientation exercises, fun things, again, to engage the brain and keep those pathways active. Music and art-based therapies, also pet therapy is up there because who doesn't love pets? Unless you have allergies, I understand, okay. But these types of treatments can be used with a more specific goal of reducing behavioral or psychological symptoms such as depression, apathy, apathy is not caring, wandering, sleep disturbances, agitation, or aggression. And when there is a diagnosis of dementia, this really requires a shift in thinking. So having worked in the field of developmental disabilities for the last 30 years, I know that we always have goals to help people achieve independence. So this goal is really not possible anymore when someone has dementia. We have to shift to maintaining abilities. We focus on autonomy as much as possible. Um, Sometimes just know that having too many choices can be overwhelming or upsetting for people. And then also focus on interdependence. What can we do together? What can we help people do to still maintain their function and feeling productive, feeling like they're helping, feeling like they're involved? So our goal becomes not to restore people with dementia to what they once could accomplish, which is considered rehabilitation, but really to maximize their functional independence and morale where they are currently. So at the NTG, we like to talk about failure-free activities. So what can we do when we're caring for people with dementia? So failure-free activities, these are we adapt activities to suit the needs and the capacity and the interests of the person that we're working with. And we focus on simple activities which reinforce self-esteem, but also relieve boredom and frustration. And we emphasize what remaining abilities the person does have. So how, how do we pick activities based on what people are still able to do? So the one I like to um, use as an example, this is a picture of a coloring book because who doesn't like coloring? I have an adult coloring book, I enjoy it. And so coloring. So just think about coloring. You know, when my kids were little, they'd go to kindergarten or whatever, and they'd always come home with a big pile of, of art pictures they had completed. So coloring now when there's dementia, we may not complete a picture. We may not even start the picture. We may just look at different pictures that we could color. We may just sort the crayons or sort the markers or look at one or two crayons, maybe our favorite color. But whatever we do in terms of coloring with the activity, as long as the person is okay, as long as they're not bored, they're not agitated, they're engaged, they're participating, then it's a failure-free activity. So some tips for creating failure-free activities are to limit choices to one at a time based on previous known preferences of the person. 
provide gentle guidance and hand over hand assistance if the person is struggling with previously learned skills, break down tasks into single step directions, waiting for the completion of each step before proceeding to the next step, because sometimes that can be overwhelming. And if a person is on step B and you tell them about step C, D, and E, they may lose track of what was I even doing with B. I may not remember. So just one step at a time. Use positive body language and calm, gentle tone of voice. And when upset, always address the underlying emotion for the person. If they're upset, try and give them names for the emotions. They may not remember, you know, what they're feeling, but try and give them names, try and help them through the emotion. But when it's too much or if it becomes, you know, really upsetting, try and distract when necessary. You can use positive comments or even diversional activities. And now I want to take a moment to show you a video because when there's dementia, we slowly lose people, but we are witnesses to their lives. And even at the end, even during dementia, we still need connection and validation. So let me stop sharing that screen and share a new screen. Hopefully you can see that. When people are very old and deteriorated and no one enters their world and they're just sitting there, they will withdraw inward more and more. And their desperate need for, for connection is all now inside. And if a person is all alone, even if they're very, very deteriorated, there's a longing for this kind of closeness. Mrs. Wilson, hello. You want me to sit? Can you see me good? Gladys Wilson is a wonderful example of a person who was in the phase of repetitive motion where people use movements, repetitive movements, because they don't have any more speech or very little speech, but they have human needs that need to be expressed. You're crying. You're crying, you have a tear right here in your face. You have a little pain, you want me to touch you. You're very sad. Can you see me? Is it scary? Are you afraid? And if this person sits with their eyes closed, rocking back and forth, and maybe there's a tear coming down, there's a need there. Here. There's a little tear that's coming out. Do you feel it? You feel a little tear? If you gently use touch, and I touched Gladys Wilson for the fingertips right here on the cheek is where the mother usually touched a child. If you touch an infant there, it looks up, and every cell remembers where it was touched by the mother. And often that person knows, even if they can't say a word at that moment, they won't talk, but or they don't want to talk, but they, there's, there's a communication. And that person is no longer alone. Can you let me in a little bit? You think? Just a little? You think I could be with you and Jesus for a minute? Jesus loves me. Yes, I know. For the Bible tells me so. I used music because when speech is gone, Music, especially with Gladys Wilson, it was religious music because there's emotion tied to it and safety tied to it. So I used her old church songs. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. What I did was, when she moved, I moved with her. And when I was singing, because she didn't sing with me, 
So I match the intensity of my voice to the intensity of her movement. And pretty soon, for a split second, we became one person. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So at one point, when she got very quiet and very peaceful, and my voice became very quiet as hers and very peaceful, and my breathing slowed to her breathing, she pulled me to her, and I moved with her. And for her at that moment, I believe I was a symbol of, of her mom. Can you open your eyes now? Feel safe and warm? Yeah. Can you sing with me? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the world in his hand. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the whole world in his hand. The breakthrough doesn't happen every time person will not always look their, open their eyes and look at you. But if you keep trying and you send, keep centering yourself and uh, really look at that person and really mirror their movements, maybe not this time, but the next time you come, you'll have a communication. You feel safe? You feel safe? Yeah. With Jesus? Yeah. And me? So I hope you enjoyed that, but let me go back to the slides. Because it's really important, again, to remember that we've got people, people with dementia, but we slowly lose the people we love with dementia. And it's really important, especially in the late stages, to try to connect with them because they're still with us. Even if we can't see that communication, even if they can't communicate with us, they need communication. They need love. They need reassurance. They need connection. So they are still there waiting and hoping to be seen and loved even in their final days. So with that, I have plenty of time for questions. I think Taylor... Yes, absolutely. So it is completely up to folks if they would like to um, ask the question in the chat or if they would like to come off of mute. I see that Teresa has her hand raised. Um, so Teresa, feel free to come off of mute to ask your question. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry about the background noise in my house. Um, I have a question regarding hearing loss and dementia. Um, what's, how is that, what's that exactly about? Because I heard that if you have hearing loss in your older years, that you should seek out getting hearing aids because you can prevent further issues. I'll, I'll take myself onto mute and I'll let you explain. Okay. I'm not sure if getting hearing aids prevents dementia. I think there are two different systems that are going on. However, I think the benefit of hearing aids comes from maintaining social connection with other people. When people lose their hearing, they become isolated. They are not able to interact even when there are people around because they can't hear. Um, and so I would think that the hearing aids really just maintain that ability to socialize and connect with other people. And there's so many benefits to being social and engaged with other people that that may offset some of the risk for dementia. I don't think it's definitely going to purely by itself prevent dementia, but anything that we can do to keep dementia at bay, I think 
would be welcome. So keeping people engaged and getting them hearing aids, I, I would be all for. What about um, this new, it's not new, it's a vitamin regarding your nerve endings. It's advertised on TV all the time about as you age, uh, this is good for your brain and your thinking. What about that? Can you speak on that? So I see the the commercials like things like Prevagen. Um, and I think there's another one that I can't remember, but um, I don't have any research data on those. So I don't feel comfortable speaking or advocating either way. But I figure if people take those and they see a benefit, great, especially if they can get them over the counter. But I am all for prevention. So the things that we can do now with good nutrition, good activity, staying socially connected, using our brains, I, I definitely think any of that is good for preventing dementia. But good questions. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for answering. Thank you so much. Enjoying this. Any other questions that I might want to ask Laura tonight? I see another hand. Vicki, go for it. Hello. So hi, I'm Vicki. Oh, hi. Um, I, the one thing I will add, um, just as a follow up to any vitamins or supplements and stuff, talk to your primary doctor before starting any regimen, because many times doctors want to make sure there won't be any negative effect of any present medication in your system. So that is one thing from the Alzheimer's Association we say yes. is before you jump on anything, talk to your doc because you want to make sure that it's on the right path for your healthy um everything healthy for yourself. So just always want to mention that one because there's a lot in the news and a lot of information flying around. So I always ask people to like look into that kind of stuff, but I loved, I came a little late, but I really wanted to learn more in the connection to both. So thanks for having this. Thanks, Vicki. I love the Alzheimer's Association. Yay. Awesome. Well, I did put in the chat the link to our Microsoft forms. Um, so that is an opportunity for folks that maybe aren't comfortable asking a question right now, um, or if you think of a question later on and want to submit that question, you are more than welcome to utilize that link. We also would love to, to have any feedback that folks have regarding uh, tonight's presentation or any topics that you're interested in hearing about, um, you know, for, for future forums. Uh, we'd love to make sure that we're we're really focusing on topics that people are interested in and want to learn more about. Um, so I'll give one last call for any questions that folks may have. All righty. Perfect. Well, then I think that we are all set for tonight. So I want to just take a moment to thank Laura for spending this evening with us uh, to be able to share her knowledge, her expertise, um, a really, really wonderful presentation. And I will send out an email um, later in the week with a recording for those that had to join late, as well as um, a PDF of Laura's presentation and the links to uh, the two documents that I shared as well. Um, so Laura, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it and, uh, and look forward to being able to share this information with more folks as we distribute the recording from tonight. You are most welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for joining. Yes. Thanks everyone.